If you have a short-term rental where it gets even remotely cold, now is probably the last time that you are going to be able to get in there and fortify it against winter and holiday guests. What's up guys? Welcome back to Airbnb ABCs. If you guys have been with me for any period of time, you can remember last year, last year, last winter in 2022 during like the Christmas season, we hit an absolute winter disaster. A massive amount of cold air came down from Canada and it pretty much blanketed the entire, at least East Coast. I don't know what happened over on the West Coast, but East East Coast of the United States in a massive cold air blast that just froze everything. It, where I live in Cincinnati was like negative 12. Where I have my places in the Smokies, it was about negative four at the lowest. And that caused a massive amount of problems, mainly with uh, HVACs not being able to keep up and pipes being burst. This happened all across the Smokies area and people lost a lot of uh, time, money, and hair off their head if they had any left from the stress. For us, it cost us about $20,000 or more in repairs and lost revenue from just being shut down, dealing with the effects of uh, burst pipes and replacing floors, doing all sorts of repairs before we were able to get back on track. And to this day, at the end of 2023, we are still kind of playing catch up financially with that. In addition, man, it was just stressful around the holidays. It was just a really awful thing. And so what I have done this year is I have spent a time, every time that I go down to my cabins in the Smokies doing everything possible to avoid that this year and we had just got back me and my business partner who's also my father from finishing our fortifications for the winter time and for the holiday guests because September is really the last warm part of the year where you're going to be able to get down there and do these things and if you have mountain cabins this is probably the way it is and I feel like most of my viewing audience is like the Smokies in uh, North Carolina and so if you want to or you need to get some of these things done now is the time so I'm going to go over today all the things that we did and a lot of these things are probably things that you may have overlooked so uh, let me know down below in the comments if any of these things helped you out um, because we are going to get into the nitty gritty of building construction and winterizing your place. So if you know me on a personal level, you'll know that safety first is not a phrase that I like to use very often at all. I will do some very sketchy stuff in order to achieve the goals that I want as long as it's me being put at risk. But when it comes to the safety of my guests, it, that is the most paramount thing. And if you guys have been following along in any of the Smoky Mountains markets, there was a major debt collapse this year that in injured a child, thank God that uh, she wasn't killed or worse, but we have a deck that was built in the late 90s and at the time joist hangers were either not a, a code requirement or were optional or something like that and it was basically just nailed in from the band boards into the floor joist. And one side set in a ledger and that's okay, but what we have been wanting to do for the longest time is add joist hangers to all of these joists and so that is what we did. And there are a lot of cabins out there in the Smoky Mountains market and pretty much it, you know any cabin or chalet that was built in the 80s or 90s 90s is likely not built with joist hangers and what these do is they just provide a level of safety where a joist cannot pull out from the band board it cannot pull out from uh any of the structural members and if it does it has a space to sit on so that the deck is it much less likely to collapse this was the thing that took up uh, a very large amount of time with us but it was a safety issue that we knew that we had to get ahead of and so if you guys have these that don't have joist hangers this is a level of uh, safety that you can add help you sleep at night and make sure that no one gets hurt or you know even killed at your properties especially the ones with these giant decks like we have on the topic of you know the cold weather coming in Air sealing, insulation, weather stripping, these are all things that uh, you are going to need to take a look at if you have one of these Smoky Mountains cabins, if you have a Blue Ridge cabin, if you are you know, in any other mountain market where it gets cold and potentially gets below freezing because most of these cabins are usually built like a screen door and they're insulated about the same. This is the bit of this entire thing that hit us the hardest last year because it caused the two pipe breaks. Uh, one was much worse than the other. It caused you know tens of thousands of dollars in damages and lost revenues. It makes your HVAC work harder. It makes your guests less comfortable because there is uh, you know cold air coming in. The places sometimes weren't able to keep up. And during our winter disaster, we had rolling blackouts for 15 minutes at a time. So as soon as our HVAC was able to try to you know catch up with the cold, it would shut off for 15 minutes and it would lose all the ground that it gained. So the majority of these cabins are on unheated crawl spaces, which is if you're not familiar with that, it's basically just the foundation uh, over a dirt 
dirt floor and there is no HVAC so it's not heated in the winter time it's not cooled in the summertime and uh, the not cooled in the summertime is not that big of an issue but the not heated in the winter time can be a huge issue if you have uninsulated pipes and you have lots of air leaks and for the first pipers this caused a problem but it did not cause any real damage we had exposed pipes in the place that we call Moonlight Ridge. And when it got down to negative four, I didn't know that there were some pipes that the insulation had been removed or had come off from previous repairs. And so that pipe froze and broke and it caused an issue with you know water uh, for the guests. It caused an issue with just water spraying in the crawl space and making it a uh, wet, muddy mess. But overall, that one was pretty easy to fix. We just had a handyman go in there, you know, replace the pipes. There was no internal damage to the cabin. And so other than a, an inconvenience, pretty severe inconvenience for the guest, uh, it wasn't that big of a, a damage issue. The reason, again, for the, that this happening is that this pipe was left completely uninsulated. So it was just a copper pipe in negative four environment that is always going to freeze and break. And we had a very porous crawl space. This cabin is built basically on concrete pillars. They built the cabin and then they put a uh, like a veneer around it of wood that had gaps in it that were anywhere from you know, an eighth of an inch up to half an inch. And what we did there is we went around and we put a backer rod in, we uh, caulked all those uh, all those openings, we used foam, uh, the, the great stuff expanding foam insulation in areas where there was uh, too big of a space. And so we really just, um, got that area much more airtight so that the cold air just could not get in there as well. But the biggest thing is that we went ahead and insulated and I made sure every little bit of that uh, pipe was insulated anywhere where there was in, even any gap. We wrapped around it with insulated tape so that in the future, if it does get that cold, and that was a record cold for that area or nearly record cold, we can feel much better that it will not freeze. Now, the, you know, pipe insulation does not heat the pipe, but it definitely does slow down on the heat loss. And so I think that if those pipes would have been insulated, we would have been okay because our other cabins were okay in any place that had insulated pipes. Pipe burst number two caused a ton of damage and it caused a ton of downtime. This is where we actually lost the most money in uh, the place not being rented because it was shut down and also to replace, we had to replace hardwood floors, we had to replace some of the subfloor and we had had to have the actual pipe fixed. What had happened was an uninsulated copper pipe in an exterior wall that went up to the spigot that fills our hot tub on the second floor had frozen and ruptured and you know that flooded the house it came down uh, on top of the through the fireplace chase into the living room and just ruined our hardwood floors that were in there and so what we did is when we had the handyman come out he replaced that copper pipe with a piece of PEX piping and if you're not familiar with that it is a plastic style of pipe that can freeze and expand it's still not recommended but it does have the ability to expand before it breaks and so it is much more uh, cold weather fortified than a copper pipe. I ended up coming back later on and going ahead and threading some uh, pipe insulation on that so it had even more uh, fortification against the cold so that hopefully we can never have this happen again. We also found that the spigot on that uh, particular cabin in that particular place was placed in a way where it drained back into the house. And these frost-free silcocks that you see have to be placed so that they drain away from the house. So when you take the hose off, the water can drain out of it. Otherwise, it freezes and can break and cause the same sort of problem where you have uh, a freeze break and the water will end up coming into the house. So in general, if you guys have uninsulated pipes and they are in exterior areas, they absolutely have to be uh, insulated. And if you can, you know, you can even use heat tape. You can, they make some automatic type of stuff. You could even put it on an outlet that is smart controlled from your phone. But again, any of those things that involve electricity aren't going to work if the electricity is out like we had quite often during our last winter storm. When we were going around looking for anywhere the cold air could come in, there's a lot of other areas other than just the crawl space where they can come in. We found that all, not just a couple, but all of the windows in our Moonlight Ridge cabin were missing the upper weather stripping on the upper sash. So that's the little piece of foam or, or whatever they put on there that goes up and seals that window against the frame. And so what was happening was without that, there wasn't enough room for the, or, or, you know, enough material there for when you lock the window for it to, you know, positively engage the seals. And so we had windows that had gaps in them, you know, a quarter inch, an eighth of an inch. And what that was doing is it was going to let in 
everything from the outside into the inside. So that's going to be your cold air in the winter, making your HVAC work harder. Your hot air in the summer, again, making your HVAC work harder, making it more humid in your place. You're letting in bugs, you're letting in dust, and pretty much anything else from the outside that you don't want in is going to be coming in. So what we did is we put that weather stripping on there. We just ordered some from Amazon and you know applied it. And so when we were able to close those windows, lock them down, it provided a positive seal on the top, bottom, and on that middle uh, check rail and is going to keep our place much more comfortable and much more energy efficient and, and more clean over the long haul. In addition, we air sealed a, any utility penetrations, for example, where wires come up through the floor, where uh, utility chases were cut out and they just bashed a hole into the uh, OSB or the plywood and you can use uh, great stuff foam insulation on there or if you have a large place you can get some xps foam board and use uh you can you can glue it up there and use foam around the the uh, great stuff foam around any other openings like that anything where things went from the inside to the outside your hvac line sets you know electrical wires cable wires places where air in in dirt and bugs and any of that stuff is going to be able to come through any of those places seal them up and you are going to be in much better shape. This is a great time to do preventative maintenance and add amenities to your places so that people will have even more reason to stay there than they already did because you guys bought top tier properties like I, like I told you. At our place we call Whispering Woods, we had a water heater that was from 1993. We bought it like that. We've kind of just been pushing that off, you know, knowing that it's probably going to fail at the worst possible time. We ended up, you know, making it and we just went ahead and replaced that with a new water heater. They're relatively cheap. And so now we have peace of mind that that's not going to give out on us during one of our high dollar holiday stays. Now we cleaned the gutters and we got our propane tank filled because we had to cut a path to the propane tank through the woods so that they would uh, re so that they would deliver it. And that's just one of those things that you have to do before the winter. If you have gas fireplaces, gas furnaces, you have to remember to get those things filled so you don't run out of propane. As far as amenities, we have added string lights to all of our decks. We feel like this makes it a really cool, fun uh, environment versus just having like one or two big lights that kind of just blind you. That soft glow of string lights uh, it seems like people like that a lot and what we do is we put those up and then we put them on a photo cell timer so that they go you know on at dusk and off in the morning and you know they're not wasting electricity which the led ones don't waste much anyhow but they are also uh you know the guests don't have to worry about plugging them in switching them on switching them off etc now when i talk about all these things in the various facebook owner groups that i'm that i'm on the number one question that I get after this, they say, oh, that's a great idea. These are all great ideas. Who do you get to do all of these things? And I have basically two answers for that. For the most part, a handyman or a specific trade, if it's required for like a, a water heater or some sort of electrical thing, they can do all of these things. But I recommend for anyone that you tackle most of these items. And there's a lot of people out there that are like, well, this is supposed to be a passive investment. I don't know what I'm doing in a house. All of these excuses for why they can or can't do it, do this. And if you end up with the knowledge and skills and ability to do this yourself and you know how to do these things and you have you know a lot of money, a lot of revenue coming in and you can afford to, to hire these things out, and you have actually stayed at your place recently, maybe it is a good idea to, to call a handyman and do it. But what we did is we were you know, spending three days, and if you can spend three days to a week deep into your rental, you are going to have a better knowledge of what's working, what's not, and it's also going to be extremely helpful if something does go wrong while well, I guess it's there. Because I know a lot of folks out there who have purchased these short-term rentals long distance, they close them long distance, they had someone else set it up, and they have actually never been to their rentals. So when a guest calls and asks what, you know, why something's not working, how something works, and you don't have any idea, you're going to look kind of foolish. For example, we found that our kitchen faucet, the little sprayer dealy thing, was leaking just a little bit every time someone would use it. And that was going, that was causing uh, water to go down in the cabinets and get the bottom of the cabinets wet. Over time, that's going to cause a you know major issue with your cabinet flooring. We found that one of our shower heads was actually leaking in the wall where it was installed. The Teflon tape was put on incorrectly, and so you know I was able to to see that while I was in there taking a shower. And it's a very small amount of water that your cleaners aren't going to pick up. The guests probably aren't going to pay any attention to. 
um, it just will not be noticed until it causes a lot of damage. And so we were able to fix that because I was physically there living in the house and was able to observe all these things. And there was countless other things that we picked up on, paint that needed to be touched up, lights that needed to be changed out, just other small things that you are never going to be notified from uh, one of the people that, that works for you or any type of guest until there is a major failure. You're also going to just save a ton of money. That's just the way that it is. Overall, with all of these things that we did, you know, spanning three days, and I only really, you know, touched the surface of this, we spent about $2,500 on materials, on food, fuel, travel, the whole deal. And when, you know, I only live like 200, you know, 20 miles away from my properties in Gatlinburg. But if I would have hired all of these things out individually, I think that we would have been somewhere in the range of uh, a $10,000 amount that we would have had to pay for all this, as well as coordinate all this around guests and other contractors coming in. And again, I got an up close and personal, intimate uh, working knowledge of what is going on with my rentals right now. So as far as I'm concerned, I have fortified these rentals to the maximum that I can for the upcoming winter and for the holiday guests. These holiday guests are gonna be paying a lot of money to stay at my place. I wanna make sure that it's nice. I wanna make sure that everything works. And you know, these places are pretty much booked consistently almost every single day so they are literally taking a beating like 24 7 so get your places in order get them ready for the winter we do not want a repeat of last winter's problems that we had with the cold with the pipe breaks with all of that stuff uh, I didn't mention that I also added space heaters to all of my cabins in case the uh, the power does go out or the HVAC can't come uh, can't keep up that allows them to plug in space heaters when the power is back on and you know quickly boost the the temperature in a room. Those are actually locked in the owner's closet so the people can't just walk off of them or use them anytime they want. We're adding a bag of rock salt to the, the cabins. We're adding snow shovels. And uh, I think that's about it as far as the things that we are adding for the guests to use. But just these are all things to get ahead of so that you guys uh, have the best guest experience, so you have the least headaches. And so everything just goes as smooth as possible uh, for your short-term rental business. So click on the links that are up uh, in the corners of the screen. They're going to tell you all about the kind of cabins that we buy, how we manage them from afar, all the trials and tribulations of running a short-term uh, rental Airbnb VRBO business. If you haven't subscribed yet, subscribe down below. Hit the like button for me for the YouTube algorithm. I appreciate you guys watching. I'll see you in the next one.